Hey guys, hello vinyl community. So um, let's continue with another video concerning uh, the albums or records I've been listening to uh, in the last weeks. And uh, in this round I thought I will focus a little more on um, progressive rock and jazz fusion and uh, uh, a little bit jazz funk in general. Let me start with some CDs I've been listening to. Um, First of all, uh, I got me this one called Alive Within a Day uh, by Squawket, which uh, obviously is a wordplay on Steve Hackett and Chris Squire. Um, this one album they did together. It's a very nice album and uh, I can imagine uh, some people probably expected something uh, which is more in the direction of uh, kind of a prog mayhem. Um, as one would probably expect when uh, these two luminaries uh, came together. But uh, it's not exactly like that. Uh, it's a very kind of melodic uh, album. There's a lot of uh, guitar solos going on by Steve Hackett, certainly. But um, it's not an album that uh, tries to drown you with uh, chops and endless solos and stuff like that. Uh, it's rather song-oriented and... Um, and overall solid rock songs. Now um, I've been listening a bit to On the Corner by Miles Davis. Um, it's probably not the most popular chapter in uh, the Miles Davis discography for, for, for jazz fans. I can imagine this is uh, deeply in his uh, sort of Afro-funk phase, uh, but as you can imagine I really like it. Um, I just love this attitude and just this uh, completely um, unrestrained uh, approach uh, towards music. Just you know, cutting these 20 minute songs like it's nothing. Um, so um, this is a very interesting phase that uh, I will certainly um, explore much more. Same goes uh, to this album here. Mwandishi by Herbie Hancock. This is an album that came out uh, around the same time when uh, Herbie Hancock was playing on this one. So um, it's uh, very much uh, influenced by uh, Miles Davis' style of music at that point in time. So again you get these giant uh, almost droney jams uh, that take easily like 20 minutes. So again three tracks on this album. Uh, very brooding, very exploratory. Just another example how massively versatile the, the, the overall oeuvre of Herbie Hancock had become over the decades, right? So uh, let's get to the vinyl records. Um, um, first of all something light-hearted and that is uh, Soul Impressions by Janko Nilovic. Uh, Jan Konilovic was recording in France in the 70s, uh, is, it's an artist from uh, Montenegro and, uh, but who basically became a French citizen I think and uh, this is a, a great example of his music which is mostly instrumental, kind of 60s jazz transported into the 70s uh, with the very kind of funky, almost um, soulful attitude, uh, all very cinematic. Uh, um, one could make the argument that uh, it's a bit of a kind of an elevator type of music now and then. Uh, it's all very kind of cute and pleasant, but um, uh, this can be a very, very good choice. Uh, I don't know, for example, if you have people over for visit and you want to play some really good music that is not obtrusive and that just it's probably liked by everyone. Then Soul Impressions by Janko is uh, probably a good choice. Uh, this is a nice re-release uh, on the Underdog uh, records that came out in 2015. But uh, the original album is from 1977 I think or 76. But uh, I'm not entirely sure right now. I would have to look that up and I can't see it anywhere here. Um, so um, so yeah, of course it's a it's a kind of a it's kind of a easy listening film music type of sound, and uh, it certainly has the demeanor of a of a uh, kind of library record, and uh, probably it was intended to be one, um, regarding that it's it has even a kind of a number here, etc. 
so a uh, very pleasant record wonderful cover what more do you need but let's get to some bona fide progressive rock this is uh, the album Osiris by the band Osiris now this is a band from Bahrain so uh, probably it's most certainly the only band from Bahrain I've ever heard of um, now they uh, recorded this in 1979 or 80 I think and uh, originally re released in 1982 but this is a re-release from 2015 on Faraway Sounds. I'm lately getting a lot of these Faraway Sounds records uh, because uh, they quite specialized in in a certain type of music, Turkish music and uh, all kind of records that if you want to get the originals you have to search a lot and probably pay a lot. And uh, so um, I'm quite happy with that. Those are usually quite uh, quite truthful What's up? A cat. Yeah, VC videos and cats. It's kind of a ongoing topic, isn't it? You want to look into the camera? If you make noises? Oh, you just want to sit here behind me. Well, why not? <laughs> why not? So Osiris made a very melodic and a very kind of riff-oriented progressive rock and uh, most obviously the strongest influence here would probably be Camel. Camel in their best years and uh, yeah they have a wonderful sound great guitar solos nice keyboard solos so um, it's uh, if you say 70s prog rock um, this is what they deliver despite the fact that this already came out in the early 80s but the point is this is a very particular uh, moment in time because uh, all of the big classic uh, names of prog rock like Genesis, uh, Yes, Camel um, they all were kind of struggling to find their place in the 80s and um, one wouldn't say that they all succeeded in the same way um, so um, this band actually kind of similar like uh, Asia Minor they were kind of carrying the torch of, uh, of a sort of good uh, solid prog rock uh, and um, basically did not care to compromise at all so um, that doesn't mean much in hindsight because this is all 30-40 years ago but um, I really like uh, this record and um, quite a nice uh, reissue uh, it comes with a bit of a liner note so uh, you can find out more about the band um, so this is this is a good one and a nice melodic uh, prog rock uh, with uh, still a lot of um, amazing guitar solos and keyboard solos and stuff like that this record here I was uh, looking for it for quite a while and um, never really succeeded to find a copy that uh, uh, that was not too overpriced uh, and um, because it doesn't even exist on CD but finally I found it and I bought it and it's a good copy and it was not too expensive um, Melodies by the Jan Hammer group um, yeah, that's a great one. I mean, you have a uh, kind of interesting, interesting uh, mixture of uh, almost poppy jazz funk music on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, quite a uh, sort of bold experimental jazz fusion uh, all coming together on one album. Um, so I guess the tracks on the A side have a little more kind of tendency towards um, like a more pleasant pleasant accessible sound while the b-side uh, is uh, certainly edgier um, it's recorded uh, with uh, Steve Kindler on violin so you get a lot of kind of interesting violin solos uh, so uh, there is a lot going on here and um, yeah I mean it's Jan Hammer so uh, you can imagine uh, the the organ and keyboard sound pretty outstanding and, but overall, it's not a it's not a crazy noisy album or something like that. It's uh, pretty pleasant to listen to and uh, uh, very kind of a late 70s uh, jazz funk, jazz fusion sound. 
Melodies by the Jan Hammer group. So one of those records where I'm kind of happy that I can finally scratch it off my list. Yeah, the next one is pretty hilarious. Um, this is um, Elegant Gypsy by Aldi Meola. Um, I mean, you can imagine how this record sounds. A lot of guitar solo mayhem by Mr. Di Meola. But it's overall a wonderful record. I really enjoy it. Um, I mean, the, the lineup is uh, totally um, insane. Um, you have, again, Jan Hammer on keyboards. Um, you have Steve Gadd on drums. You have uh, Lenny White on drums. You have uh, Paco de Lucia playing a kind of Spanish flamenco guitar. This one flamenco track here the, where Aldi Meola and Paco are playing in a duet. So that is quite a, quite a sort of a Andalus mayhem. Um, so uh, it's funny because the, the cover gives you certainly a kind of a corny vibe. And uh, if this is how Aldi Meola saw himself, why not go for it? But uh, if you listen to it, it's, it's uh, in parts very different. It's very different uh, sound and very, very uh, kind of in the spirit of the 70s jazz fusion and uh, some great guitar playing. But also very melodic, so I really like it. So um, now let's move towards Japan. You have some... Oh, no, no, no. I want to show you this one here. So I, I thought this is a really a nice album. So let's mention, let's, mention, um, let's mention Ian Dury for a second. So if you listen to Ian Dury, who basically was a punk rocker that suddenly became this uh, kind of international phenomenon with his band Block Hats. Um, of course, the the question is, what what is it that makes the Ian Jury sound so idiosyncratic and so different from all the other kind of British uh, punk rock bands of those years? And uh, this is not a mystery, of course. It's because there is this kind of a strange, funky funky jazz funky sound in his music and of course it's a known fact that this was um, brought into his sound by Chaz Janko who played keyboards and guitar in, in his band and um, so I always for years I've wondered if, if Chaz Janko ever made a solo album or more solo albums and I could imagine those gotta be funky as hell um, because uh, then if this was like his favorite type of sound then he would really kind of break loose with it so um finally i remembered that and started to look up just uh, if there is some kind of uh, what albums are there by chess jankel so uh, i came across his uh, his uh, debut album which is self-titled and has a shockingly boring cover um but um as expected is funky as hell <laughs> so uh, this is a uh, kind of cool, uh, almost almost quite disco-ish to some extent album. Um, I mean, sounds nothing like Ian Jury and the Blockheads. And, um, but uh, very, very cute, very nice, uh, sort of uh, interesting uh, snapshot of the early 80s uh, when, when this kind of British jazz funk was happening all across the place and it fits in pretty well. Um, so um, this was not expensive. Um, I just had to look a little bit and uh, there I had it. Um, it is this giant song on the B-side which is called Am I Honest With Myself Really? Which is like 15 minutes. Uh, so um, it's something that will kind of make your legs move if you understand. Um, so uh, that's Chess Jankel. And uh, moving on. Um, yeah, so I've been... Uh, listening a lot to this wonderful album. This is uh, Sadao Watanabe and the album is called Echo. Now this came out in 1979. Um, it's a Japanese uh, sax and flute player and um, this is uh, modal jazz and jazz fusion and uh, it is a kind of a collection. It's in a sense it is a compilation um, but it is uh, like a basically like a suitcase of recordings he did between 1968, I think, and 1974. 
Uh, so uh, all kind of tracks, uh, like half of it is live, the rest is recorded in different studios. Um, yeah, um, great sound, uh, lovely, lovely music, just, uh, just some, it's, it's, it's just a very, very pleasant uh, kind of jazzy feeling to this record. Uh, very, feels like summer for me. Um, I started to listen to it just when the weather kind of changed here towards sunny and warm and uh, so um, great album and uh, yeah this is an original pressing that I got and that to my surprise wasn't that uh, expensive at all sometimes you are just lucky um, so uh, this actually came out on CBS uh, just a little, little uh, inlay here with a photo with a kind of soprano saxophone um, yeah, so um, of course uh, Sad Sadao Watanabe is a famous sax player in the Japanese jazz scene, well known. Um, for me this was uh, kind of new territory, first I just went uh, kind of by the cover, which I thought is a really cool cover with a nice attitude and uh, so I started to look up the music and thought I have to get this one. Also there is uh, Kazumi Watanabe playing guitar here and um, those two are not related, but Watanabe is kind of one of the most uh, common names, in, family names in Japan, kind of like Kobayashi. Um, and uh, so uh, this brings me to Kazumi Watanabe. Now, people often know Kazumi Watanabe from Yellow Magic Orchestra because he was part of the Yellow Magic Orchestra live lineup. So if you sometimes see these uh, Yellow Magic Orchestra um, concert recordings from the tour in America in the late 70s and on the left side of the stage uh, there is always this guy with curly hair playing some crazy stuff on his electric guitar so that's Kazumi Watanabe um, so um, he did some really outstanding uh, solo albums and uh, in the style of jazz funk and jazz fusion and um, this one uh, is Killin. Um, this uh, came out in 1979. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful, very kind of light-hearted uh, jazz fusion and jazz funk sound with an outstanding guitar player. Very funky. But um, the lineup is completely insane because you have uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto on keyboards, you have Akiko Yano on piano, you have Ray O'Hara on bass, uh, you have Yasuaki Shimizu on tenor saxophone. So um, this is a quite a cool lineup uh, with uh, great uh, and interesting musical sensibilities. So uh, at the same time, uh, it sounds very, very, um, very pleasant and very accessible. But on the other hand, it's constantly kind of squeezing in sort of bold and interesting ideas, particularly in the keyboard department. So it's great fun to listen to this. Uh, and interestingly, um, the same year, this double album came out, which is Killin' Life. And uh, Killin' Life is the same lineup, just a, a concert. Um, and what's really interesting is that uh, if you get these two albums together, the studio one and the live one, um, there are no songs, no tracks overlapping. So for their concert, they just recorded completely different material. They wrote completely different songs for that. So um, they kind of nicely go together, the studio version and uh, the live version. But uh, but the music, the songs on, 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 on uh, this uh, records are completely different. It's kind of a nice idea for a, for a cover. If you open the gatefold... Um, so this is like a, like a layout for the stage. So uh, you, like you see here, this is uh, the corner for Ryuchi Sakamoto. This is Akiko Yano's piano here. You have the drums here, etc. And uh, pretty cool. So uh, staying with Kazumi Watanabe, um, I have just two more albums here that I gave a listen. I bought those quite a while ago and uh, I really like those. Um, so this is uh, The Spice of Life, which came out in 1987. Um, this is a trio work, uh, Kazumi Watanabe on guitar, Bill Bruford on drums and Jeff Berlin on bass. So um, 
do I need to say more? <laughs> That's certainly uh, some uh, exciting uh, music playing. And uh, yeah, great record. Uh, all very tight and uh, at the same time it's never it's never too self-indulgent in a strange way. It's not a overboarding fusion album but much more a kind of a disciplined tight jazz funk record. And uh, a year later Watanabe followed this up with The Spice of Life Part 2 which is the same lineup, Bruford drums, uh, Jeff Berlin bass, but this time with uh, Peter John Vatessi on keyboards. So here they are like a four piece. Vatessi was uh, the quite hilarious uh, keyboarder of Jethro Tull uh, on their, particularly on their like early 80s music, Broadsword, uh, Under Wraps, the hyper popular album. But the keyboards are really kind of very disciplined here. They also did like a big tour with this music and uh, but I've never I've never seen any any kind of video or TV recording of this tour with Bill Bruford and Jeff Berlin. And uh, that's it for that round. So this was more about fusion, jazz funk and progressive rock. And I hope there was something that you thought was interesting or intriguing and uh, kind of made you uh, take a note and uh, look it up or whatever. So uh, have a nice day and um, see you in the next video because I still have some records to show you.